All right, so is it making sense? All right, because this is one of those moments that I had while we were in Israel. It happened early in the trip. Um, we, we started out um, near Caesarea, and I had read about Caesarea, but I didn't really study it. I didn't know anything much about the city, but I am Italian, and I knew there was a guy named Cornelius from the Italian band. Now, I think he probably played guitar because that's the best instrument God loves the most. But he had another kind of band. He was in, in a Roman centurion, which meant he had 100 men working for him, right? So I remembered the story of Peter being told that he was going to have to go with these people that weren't Jews, right? Remember when he had the open vision? And I'll talk about it a little bit here. But I didn't know when he went to Cornelius' house what that meant. I just thought he was going to Cornelius' house. So, you know, you're on the tour, you're over in Israel, everybody's all excited and you're happy and you don't really know what to expect. And we show up and they say, this is Caesarea. And like, okay, that's cool. And then it hits me. Like, this wasn't just a town. This was where Herod the Great, you know, the really, like, crazy guy. He had the three sons who were even crazier than him. But Herod was the one that wanted to kill the babies, right? Like, just crazy. He was a master architect. And we went to several things that he built there, and it was off the charts. Brilliant how he built them. Guess how he built them? Slave labor. Okay? Everybody the Romans captured then became a, a, a stonemason and all the things that Herod wanted to build. So this was not just some little city. This was the palace that Herod used when he was in uh, Israel. This is where Pontius Pilate stayed. It was on the coast. It was elaborate beyond what you could even imagine. There's still remnants of the swimming pool right on the Mediterranean that he had built. You could still see the tile that was there, but there was this whole big palace and infrastructure so that when the Romans came from Rome to Israel, they got a taste of Rome, which I would say is opulence beyond, like decadence. Because they were constantly flashing the card, we're your boss. These are my relatives, by the way, <laughs> right? We rule with an iron thumb, and what we think is normal, you will never achieve. You'll never have enough money to live like we live, and you're only alive because I haven't chosen to kill you. So be happy you're a slave. Who does that sound like? The devil. <laughs> they ruled with an iron fist. They crucified you at the drop of a hat just to, to get everybody else to realize you can't mess around with them. You can't go against them. So Peter, who's this fisherman, unsophisticated fisherman, well, might as well just read it, right? Acts chapter 10, start with Cornelius first, my cousin. <laughs> I haven't found him yet on uh, the DNA search online on Ancestry.com. I'm still looking for Cornelius. Doesn't even sound like an Italian name, but... They did things different then. At that time, there was a Roman military officer, Cronius, who was in charge of 100 men stationed in Caesarea. Okay, again, that didn't mean anything to me until I got to the city. When I saw the size of the palace, and I saw how different that was than everything else, you know, you're driving through miles of just desert and no life, and all of a sudden you come upon this opulent city right on the Mediterranean. It's like total culture shock, difference. So that's where he was stationed. One afternoon at 3 o'clock, he had an open vision and saw the angel of God appear right in front of him, calling out his name, Cornelius. And the angel told him, send some men to Joppa at once. Have them find a man named Simon the Rock. And Cornelius called for two of his servants and a trusted what? A trusted godly soldier. How rare do you think a Roman would be called a trusted godly soldier? <laughs> right? But this man, Cornelius, was a believer. So one of his men was a believer, at least one. Now, if you're a regular citizen in J Jerusalem or any of the cities and you see a Roman soldier come by, you're paying attention because you do not want him talking to you because they represent Rome. You don't mess with that guy. You think a state trooper's bad, Roman soldier would be much worse. Okay? Here's this heathen guy in the palace of Rome that's in Israel, he's praying to God, and an angel appears to him. Like, what are the odds of that? In the midst of the belly of the beast, there was a godly man there that's calling out to God, and, and the angel says, God's heard your prayers. Call for this man named Simon. 
So he sends two of his servants and a soldier. <laughs> All right, yeah, I know, wow, it hit me. A little bit later in the chapter, Peter was up on the roof at the time of prayer. The vision comes. I'm not going to go through all that. You probably know what happened. But it says in verse 19, as he was deep in thought, trying to interpret the vision, the Spirit said to him, go downstairs now, for three men are looking for you. Don't hesitate to go with them, because I have sent them. So, okay, I don't know what's going on, but I haven't known what's going on most of the time, but I'm serving God, so I'm going to be obedient because I know it's the voice of the Lord. He goes downstairs, and one of the three guys is a Roman soldier. This is not user-friendly. This would really put a big fear in you. When you see the lights go on behind you on the highway, you're not thinking good thoughts, are you? You're hoping, hope it's not me. Hope it's somebody else he's going to pull over. Those, whatever that is in your body that kicks in is really kicking in. Like, oh, no, I don't need another impre premium increase <laughs> on my insurance. Please pass me by. <laughs> Stay trooper. <laughs> so he did go. Peter was obedient. And where is he going? Like I said, he's walking into the belly of the beast. He's going to Caesarea, which is where the palace is. And, you know, one of the other things that you notice when you're in Israel even today is the difference between those that have and those that don't have because the ones that don't have really don't have i mean it's very obvious and i'm not going to go off on that trail but it was even worse in the time of jesus okay because the romans constantly flexed their muscles of their power and they kept the people reminding the people that you are slaves which is exactly what the devil wants to do so here's peter now a fisherman not very qualified to speak inside the palace of caesarea and he walks in with them, and, and in verse 25 says, The moment Peter walked in the door, this centurion, Cornelius, who's got a hundred men under him, falls down at his feet. That's what it says. To worship him. Talk about Peter thinking, what did I just step into? I have no idea why I'm here, but I'm thinking I'm in trouble. But he walks in, and the leader falls at his feet to worship him. And Peter says, wait a minute. He pulls him up to his feet and says, stand up, for I'm only a man and no different from you. Think of the humility there. Because if Peter was still dealing with his insecurities of what happened in the Gospels about denying Christ, when this guy fell down at his feet, he might have been tempted to let him stay there a little while. I'm liking this worship thing. That's the cistern. See, that's you on the throne. But the spring is saying, no, no, that's the wrong spirit. That's not what we're trying to convey to people. That's not who God is in you, Peter. That had to be all stripped down off of him. All that pride, all that junk. Anybody here need that? Yes, we do. So it's not negative if he says, you're a portal to my power in your weakness. Weakness is not a negative there. Because none of us are going to score 10 out of 10 on every single thing in life. Sorry to break the news. We all need help in something. And that's where he wants us to live, in that position, that posture of needing help. How am I doing on time? Pretty good. Okay. And then this hit me. Sorry, 34. Peter looks at this guy in this situation. And he says, now I know for certain that God doesn't show favoritism with people, but treats everyone on the same basis. <laughs> now, I always thought, prior to going to Israel, that... Peter's looking and going, God, wow, you would even save a soldier in the Roman army, a leader in the Roman army. Like, everybody is able to come into the kingdom, right? That was how I always heard it taught, and that's true, that God's no respecter of persons, drug addict to politician to Wall Street banker. Everybody's eligible to be saved. But I also now think Peter was saying, you're using me. You're no respecter of persons. Like, I'm the least likely person to be standing in this palace talking to the centurion and him falling at my feet to worship me. Oh, my God, you can use anybody. And that was me thinking, wow, who am I to, to tell God no? Right? I mean, if you know it's his voice. Your qualifications isn't what got him to tell you to do it. Right? It's that you, his spirit is living on the inside of you. So if he calls you, he anoints you because he appointed you. 
That was the title of a book called Anointed and Appointed. 